All trains to and from Victoria Railway Station must cross the River Thames over the old Grosvenor Bridge. First constructed in 1859 and twice extended, it is now to be rebuilt without any interruption to normal train services. The whole scheme will involve a series of difficult navigational operations carried out in all seasons of the year and subject to the hazards of tide and current, wind and weather. London's Victoria Station. With 17 platforms and more than a thousand train arrivals and departures every 24 hours, Victoria has long been recognized as a major railway terminal. A terminal where every train in and out of the station must cross the old Grosvenor Bridge. The bridge now to be rebuilt in situ without any hold up to passenger services. So during the time the contractors are at work, Millions of passengers in and out of Victoria will cross the Thames while the Grosvenor Bridge is virtually rebuilt under them. But can a railway bridge serving a terminal like Victoria and carrying a thousand trains a day be completely rebuilt without any hold-up to essential passenger services? We asked the Chief Civil Engineer, Southern Region, Mr Cantrell. Yes, it can. As a matter of fact, we shall be rebuilding nine single line bridges and adding a tenth without any hold ups whatsoever. The only restriction will be a speed limit on the bridge and its approaches, purely for safety reasons. We anticipate the work will take four to five years, and during the whole of that time, eight of the nine tracks will be constantly in use. But to achieve this without uh, any real difficulty, especially on the approaches, does mean very careful organisation. At each stage, when one track is converted to go into the other, permanent way will have to be realigned and alterations will have to be made to points, signals, electric cables, and so forth. But as yet, the busy tracks outside Victoria Station still connect up to the old Grosvenor Bridge, where the 17 platform lines from the station converge into nine lines, creating a bottleneck on the bridge. The passage of a train shows how the old structure of the 1860s reacts to the heavy traffic of the 1960s. But before going on with the story of the new Grosvenor Bridge, let's go back a hundred years or so to the days when the first two-track bridge was under construction. Concrete raft foundations were placed in timber cofferdams with shafts built up in brickwork and faced with limestone. The superstructure was built of wrought iron with four two-pinned arches supporting the deck. 
And now, after more than a hundred years in service, the old Grosvenor Bridge, with its two extensions, is due for reconstruction to meet modern standards. And from past to present day operations on the same site, where demolition and reconstruction is going ahead, with the bridge open to rail and river traffic all the time. Early pile driving operations round the piers are well advanced and a lot of supporting framework for the coffer dams is in position. Weather beaten for more than a century, the face of the old pier, built in 1859, will soon vanish behind the steelwork of the coffer dam. The river level can rise and fall as much as five feet an hour, with currents running up to six knots. With the lower piling already driven, the upper piling is lowered to overlap it, and the encircling walls of the coffer dam take shape. The upper piling is pitched in the conventional way, but to avoid splicing in the restricted area under the arches, the piles are assembled in panels at the nose end of the pier, clear of the bridge. They are suspended from chain blocks and moved into position along the runway beam to form a wall 170 feet long. With all the sheet piling in position and supported by internal frames, a team of divers place an underwater concrete seal between the upper and lower piles. Keeping the bridge open throughout the period of reconstruction set the designers a difficult problem. Mr. Kerensky of Freeman Fox and Partners. We have several problems. First of all, the old structure consists of three separate bridges, each with its own foundation, which have to be partially demolished and then rebuilt into one unit. Secondly, owing to the complex sequence of track diversions, the work of reconstruction cannot be carried out in proper order from track one to nine and will have to be done piecemeal. Last but not least, to avoid interruption in traffic, much of the critical work will have to be done at nights and during the weekends. The man responsible for detailed planning of all this is Mr. F. A. Partridge. The work was planned to be carried out in two distinct phases. Let me explain. Here is the side elevation of one of the three piers of the old bridge. And here, the nine tracks. The bridge was built in three stages, starting in 1859, with this part carrying tracks three and four. Six years later, the bridge was widened for tracks five, six, seven, eight and nine, and in 1901, widened again for tracks one and two. The three foundations were separate and quite different in type. We decided to strengthen the foundations by embedding them in concrete to form one enlarged monolithic base. In phase one, the foundations of all three piers will be reinforced in this way. Meanwhile, trains will continue to run normally on the old tracks. In phase two, the tracks will be replaced one at a time, starting with track number nine. The track and its superstructure will be demolished. The underneath slice of each pier shaft will be reconstructed and the steelwork for the new track erected. Additional track number 10 will go in here in the space at present occupied by gas mains and thereafter the order of replacement will be 
six, seven, eight, and five, four, three, two, and one. And so, after 18 months in phase two, tracks 10, 6, and 9 will be in service on new bridge work, and 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 on the old superstructure. 7 and 8, of course, are being replaced. After another 18 months, the reconstruction of the bridge will be complete with 10 tracks in service. The operations in both phase one and phase two are shown in more detail on a cross section of the pier. Phase one will begin with the construction of coffer dams around the old piers. First of all, the lower piles will be pitched and driven into the London clay. The upper piles will then be brought into position to lap the lower ones. The coffer dam will be strutted, the gap between the piles plugged with concrete, and the coffer dam dewatered. The river bed will be excavated five feet into the London clay. A concrete slab will be cast to span between the piling and the old foundations. Base concrete will then be cast round the separate foundations. Phase two will begin on track nine with the removal of struts and the rail track with its supporting arches, followed by the pier masonry and brickwork immediately below. Bars will be grouted into the core of the old shaft to key in the new concrete and bearing concrete will follow. The concrete steps will be cast and then the wall. Ultimately, the erection of the new superstructure will be followed by the packing of final concrete behind the bearings. And now, the reconstruction scheme in action. Inside the coffer dam, phase one is now forging ahead with the excavation work round the foundations of the old bridge. To minimize heaving of the clay bed, excavations are confined to sections six foot wide. Several thousand cubic yards of clay, including some ancient piles from the original coffer dam, will be hoisted and taken away before the new concrete can be laid. With the completion of the excavation to a depth of five feet, shear connectors are stud welded to the inside face of the lower sheet piles. The concrete foundation slab is cast in rapid hardening cement to provide early strength and further resistance to heaving of the clay. And after placing 12 feet of base concrete to form a single monolithic foundation, phase one on this pier will be complete. By this time, in the north of England near Middlesbrough, the superstructure of the bridge is well in hand. The new Grosvenor Bridge is an all-welded job, and its clean outlines and flat surfaces will make for easy protection and maintenance. Every steel plate goes through a grit blasting plant. The resulting surface is free of rust and mill scale, but not yet ready for painting. First, there's a tolerance check to make sure the plate thicknesses are correct. And then, an acid test for cleanliness. All principal wells are given non-destructive tests, ultrasonic and radiographic. 
after shot painting and before the half arches go to sight, a final check on the thickness of the paint. On site, phase two begins with the removal of track nine using a pontoon unit and a mobile overhead service girder. Already cut at the crown and supported by the service girder, the arch forms two half units, each complete with decking and ready to be transferred to the pontoon now moving towards the bridge. With the approach of high tide and the pontoon in position, all is ready to transfer the first half arch. And as the water level rises, the trestles on the pontoon take the full weight. The gap at the centre grows wider as the pontoon with its load is winched away. All clearances are tight, especially under the service girder and over the coffer dam. But the tidal predictions are correct, and within minutes of high water, the half arch is well clear of the bridge. And after looking down on the changing river scene for more than a hundred years, the first half arch floats away. In turn, each half arch, complete with rail track, will be towed downriver and broken up. And one by one, the new half arches will be floated in. All achieved by a practical application of time and tide. And with the second half arch removed, demolition gangs start work on the masonry. With the adjoining track still in use, piers and abutments are cut away to base level, leaving only a central core. The onshore mixing plant is supplying concrete for reconstruction work on the pier shaft. Despite the distance from the shore, the pumping system delivers a steady flow of concrete to the piers in lifts of 150 cubic yards per shift. Hard plywood shuttering along the sides of the piers produces a smooth surface to discourage marine growths. In the case of the curved cutwaters, timber boarding faced with fiberglass is used. A half a mile or so down river at the Nine Elm site, arch ribs from the works near Middlesbrough are arriving for assembly with the deck units. Also at Nine Elms, a deck section swings into position. At this stage, each deck is already fitted with runway beams and drain pipes. The assembly gantry is built so that the decks can be lowered onto a pair of half ribs and assembled in a horizontal position. The arch ribs and deck units were fabricated at different works and this is the first time they are put together to form a complete half arch span. Now, with minor imperfections corrected, the result is a perfect fit. The spandrel post on the arch rib is carefully guided into place.
With the first half of the deck squarely supported by the spandrel posts, the second and smaller deck is lowered into place. The small unit goes between the arch ribs at the crown end of the assembly. Draw cleats enable both deck units to be pulled into position, leaving a gap between the small unit and the arch ribs for welding. A carefully prepared welding program minimizes shrinkage, distortion and locked up stresses. When the arch ribs and the decks are welded together, the half arch is moved laterally to a second assembly position for the attachment of minor fittings and to finish off the welding. A batch of half arches with ribs and decking line up on a gantry extending out over the river to await transfer to the pontoon which runs a shuttle service to the bridge. Spanning the pontoon from one side of the jetty to the other, the foremost half arch awaits high water on which the two familiar trestles will rise and make lifting contact. On the rising tide, the pontoon lifts the half arch clear of the supporting bogies on the gantry. So another operation is carried out by harnessing the lifting power of the rising tide. And the half arch floats serenely away to take up a temporary overnight mooring near the bridge. Another day and another tide is rising, providing lifting power to float the new half arch into its final place. The mobile service girder is in position, ready to take its weight. The height of the pontoon trestles is set according to the predicted height of the tide. And as the moment of high water comes, the countdown begins. As the seconds tick away, control of the maneuver is in the hands of the men on the pontoon. Maneuvering the half arch over the side of the cofferdam is a hazardous navigational operation beset with difficulties, including the vagaries of the weather, especially the speed of the current and the force of the wind. This is the first of 80 floating in operations and much depends on its success. Just before the peak of high water, the service girder takes over the full load. The half arch is lifted from the pontoon and held, ready to take up its final position. A day later, and the second half arch is coming upriver to join the first on the bridge. 
to be floated in on the rising tide as before and transferred to the service girder. Both half arches are suspended from the service girder with their decks gradually coming together. In the suspended position, the complete arch is positioned for line and level, bolted up and so becomes virtually a jig for setting its own bearings. And when the bearings are concreted in, the complete arch will become self-supporting and ready for welding deck and ribs at the crown. After another three months, with all four arches of track nine on the downstream side erected, the deck is waterproofed. Layers of bitumen and bitumen sheeting are protected by brindle tiles, ready for track laying. The following weekend, a cold dawn brings the end of an all-night track laying operation in sight. With the temporary 60-foot service rails already laid on the bridge itself, the final connections are made on the south approaches. Almost covered by 600 tons of ballast, the service rails on the bridge are lifted to the correct levels by a hydraulic tamping machine. Working ahead of the machine, an engineer gauges the track and checks the cross and longitudinal levels. Preceding the tamping machine is a travelling tower equipped with transmitters, one over the centre of the track and one over each rail. These record the correct levels and the information is fed back by infrared rays to the tamping machine itself, which lifts the sleepers hydraulically. And eight metal feet, or tines, compact the ballast. Alongside the temporary service track, the conductor rail is bonded with a hydraulic press forcing heavy copper connectors into the rail ends for good electrical continuity. Now, after several days in use, the track has settled down. The temporary 60-foot rails are replaced by three permanent lengths, each 300 feet long, and welded into one section, traversing the bridge from one end to the other. Gaps between the rail ends are covered with a clay mould and a crucible containing a mixture of powdered metal and magnesium is placed over the mould and ignited. Welding the three rails into one 900 foot length will eliminate vibrations otherwise set up by trains passing over normal fish plate joints. At 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the seal breaks and the mould fills with metal. Still in a semi-plastic condition, the weld is trimmed with a pneumatic chisel and the rough outline of the finished joint begins to take shape. As soon as it's cooled to the air temperature, the welded joint is ground down to the profile of the rail.
At each end of the bridge, expansion switches absorb normal heat expansion and contraction in the long sections of track. Now, only three weeks after the last span was floated in, the first track is open to traffic and the new track nine is complete. As the months go by, work on phase two pushes ahead and the demolition and reconstruction of the inside tracks set new problems. Shut in on both sides by bridges still open to traffic. Restricted working space and restricted access for plant and materials. Instead of floating out a half arch at a time as before, the inner arches are cut up into smaller and more manageable pieces. With the mobile service girder in position overhead, the pieces are lowered to Thames barges. In the restricted areas below the bridge, this method of demolishing is quicker and less hazardous. This time, demolition of the masonry and later the reconstruction in concrete is maintained without interruption by special heavy whalings spanning the full slice. As before, the masonry is taken away down to the surface of the base concrete, leaving a core of original brickwork. To keep up the timing of the overall program, concreting goes on throughout the year in all weathers. The normal time allowed to demolish and rebuild a slice of any one pier is 28 days. With the completion of the center piers and abutments, an interior half arch is on its way upriver, ready to float into position. But this time, the massive structure must be floated under the existing steelwork into the center of the bridge. But essential overhead clearances are assured by the pontoon's adjustable trestles. Once clear of possible collision with the vulnerable steelwork above, the second half arch floats slowly into position to join up with the first half already suspended from the service girder. And a few moments before high water, the half arch is edging over the coffer dam. Within a matter of hours, two more half arches come together. The bearings will soon be concreted in and the deck and ribs welded into one at the crown. And before long, yet another part of the bridge is handed over and another new track goes into service. As the work enters its final stage, the progressive removal of the walls of the coffer dam reveals the fine outlines of the new concrete piers and abutments. And now, within four and a half years of starting the work of reconstruction, the last of the new tracks comes into service and the continuous role of Victoria Station as a vital rail terminal is assured by the new bridge. With the 10 tracks available across the Thames, Victoria Station is geared to the future. Business trains to Kent, Sussex and Surrey. Boat trains to the Channel Ports. Flight connections to Gatwick Airport and eventually to London Airport. And in the more distant future, perhaps, 
direct train services to Europe via the Channel Tunnel. Grosvenor Bridge, the new railway bridge across the Thames. Thank you.